food bloggers. Hi, how are you today? Thank you so much for tuning in to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. This is the place for food bloggers to get information and inspiration to accelerate your blog's growth and ultimately help you to achieve your freedom, whether that's financial, personal, or professional. I'm Megan Porta. I have been a food blogger for 13 years, so I understand how isolating food blogging can be. I'm on a mission to motivate, inspire, and most importantly, let each and every food blogger, including you, know that you are heard and supported. How much time do you invest in food styling and thinking about your photos before you take them? Just curious because personally, I've been food blogging so long that I really don't pay proper attention to this part of it anymore. But my conversation today with Joe Kiahan, she is the blogger over at the Family Food Kitchen, has really inspired me to give a little bit more attention to food styling. Joe started out as a food stylist versus a blogger. She was an intern at Good Housekeeping. She had other food styling experience that prepared her to be an amazing food blogger and a stylist in that realm. She gives us a lot of great things to think about, such as planning before you even start the recipe, thinking about your ingredients thoroughly beforehand while you're shopping, how to prep to get the best photos, what you should include in a food styling kit, backdrops, props, plating, garnishes. Oh my gosh, she covers so much in this episode. And there were things she mentioned that I hadn't even thought about before. So I hope this inspires you like it inspired me. This is episode number 516, sponsored by Rank IQ. Are you tired of falling through the cracks as a seasoned food blogger? It's just assumed that once a food blogger gets to a certain number of years or a certain level of traffic, that they don't need resources or direction any longer. We're good, right? No, we're not good. This couldn't be further from the truth. Seasoned food bloggers need guidance and relevant information too. There are ways to find the guidance and support we need, such as high quality mastermind groups and retreats. But if those options don't align with your budget or your schedule, then you're kind of out of luck. We are relegated to sorting through all the information in Facebook groups when we don't know how trustworthy the sources of information even are. All of this is exactly why my friend Melissa, the blogger behind Mama Gourmand, and I have decided to put together a workshop-style summit geared specifically toward advanced food bloggers. We are gathering no more than 50 people in Denver, Colorado in May 2024 to give monetized food bloggers the love and support they need and deserve. Go to flavormediasummit.net to get all the information you need about speakers, dates, our vision for the event, and to fill out an application. This experience is going to be highly valuable and one of a kind. We cannot wait to see some of you there. Many of the spots have already been taken for this event, so if this is intriguing to you, fill out an application today. Go to flavormediasummit.net, follow the link to tickets and application, and apply today. Since graduating from culinary school in New York City in 2010, Joe freelanced as a recipe developer and food stylist in test kitchens of many America's best-known publications, such as Bon Appetit magazine, Epicurious, and Savour. She has also worked with a variety of household brands like Williams Sonoma, Weight Watchers, Staub, Cookware, Danone, Kraft, and more. She started off as a BBC journalist and then worked in PR in London, but a love for cooking and a desire to find a fulfilling career, which would allow her to spend more time with her three kids, took her back to school to study cooking. After moving to the United States, she was lucky enough to attend the Institute of Culinary Education in New York City. Now she runs her own food blog, The Family Food Kitchen, helping other busy families eat well, even when time is short. Her blog focuses on easy, delicious, and doable recipes and contains lots of one-pot, sheet pan, and easy meal ideas. Joe, it is so great to have you on the podcast. How are you today? I'm great. It's great to be here, Megan. Thank you for having me. Yes, super excited to chat about food styling. I don't think we talk about this a whole lot or not enough here on eBlog Talk, so Super excited to learn from you today, but first, do you have a fun fact to share with us? 
I do. I am an absolute travel obsessive. I have to say, I've tra- I've travelled to so many countries. I've I've probably lost count, and I've also worked in quite a lot of places around the world. I've worked in Bavaria in Germany. I taught English in Sri Lanka when I was a student. I've worked in a beach bar in Jamaica. I also lived and worked in Sydney, Australia, for eighteen months um, in my twenties. So yes, mm. I am a total. <laughs> I'm a total travel nut. And I have to say, I try and fool myself. I'm kind of still traveling because as you can tell, I'm a Brit, but I live in America. So I tell myself. (laughs) (laughs) You're still on the road. (laughs) I'm still on the road, even though I've been here 15 years and three kids later. (laughs) Oh, I love that. And do you have, I, anytime someone says this as a fun fact, I have to ask the question. Do you have a handful of top favorite places that you've been? I do. I love like Southeast Asia. It's definitely my favorite. And Thailand is probably my favorite country of all. I mean, the food for a start is incredible. People are so lovely. It's just the scenery, spectacular, all of it. I would love to go back one day, one day. Yes, one day. But you have other adventures, it sounds like, to take. I just love people who travel. It says so much about them, I think. They're adventurous. They like exploring. They like different foods. They like interacting with different cultures and humans. I think there's so much there. So. I agree. I wish I could yeah. just do more of it. <laughs> I know. I know. I have not done nearly enough traveling, but I love it too. My husband and I this year were like, we have passports for all of our family. They're all current. There's nothing stopping you now then. <laughs> Why are we not going somewhere internationally? So we have that on our agenda to just just to figure it out this year. Like we need to go do a first maybe Europe, Italy, or Ireland. I don't know. We just yeah. need to get out a little bit. <laughs> just just start doing it. Yeah, for yeah, sure. exactly. You just have to do it. So great to know that about you. So we're going to talk about food styling and how you got into that. And you have some amazing tips for people who want to just style their food a little bit better. But to frame this, would you just tell us a little bit about your blog? Sure. So yeah, my blog is called The Family Food Kitchen. And as the name suggests, it's all about helping you feed your family. We've obviously all got such busy lives. I've got three kids myself. We really don't want to be in the kitchen all day. But that said, you know, we all know that we have to eat better and I don't know about you, but I just worry about the kids having processed snacks, particularly all the time. And I just, you know, want to help my my readers, my audience make more simple, good for you from scratch food. So I just try and keep it really simple. I make easy, doable recipes. If it's not good and it's not fast, it doesn't get made in my house and it doesn't get on my blog. So that really is my test. And that's kind of the lens through which I filter all of my, my recipes. So I focus on a lot of easy dinners, you know, like one pot things, one pan things, sheet pan dinners, things that don't take long, still taste really good and don't need a lot of cleanup, basically. Oof, that's the perfect niche. Easy, no cleanup or limited cleanup. Yeah. <laughs> Easy dinners. I do try and be really strict with myself, you know, in terms of what actually makes it on the blog because I, I know the type of recipes my audience need. <laughs> I am my audience. <laughs> yeah, quality control is super important. So when did you start your blog? So I started my blog, like lots of people, in 2020 during COVID. I actually have been food styling and recipe developing for a long, a lot longer than that. Um, when I moved to New York City in 2010, I wanted a career change. I was working as a food PR. I'd worked in journalism before that, but I wanted to go back to culinary school, which I did. And I was lucky enough to go to the Culinary Institute in New York. And I knew I wanted to work in food media. So I was lucky enough to get an internship with a good housekeeping magazine, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I feel like I really learned how to recipe develop and, and recipe test from the best Oh, absolutely. And I I got to go on lots of food shoots and it just made me realize I loved the food styling piece. It's so creative. I think it's also a great complement to recipe development. And it's just good to have, you know, both of those twin skills. So I just took a bunch of jobs, said yes to everything, worked as a freelance. I worked all over New York City, literally in test kitchens of, you know, some of the great magazines, you know, Bon Appetit, Epicurious, The Ver magazine. And I just le- tried to learn my craft. And I didn't know it at the time, but it turned out to be an amazing training ground for having a food blog. <laughs> for sure. So you brought food styling into your blog. Usually it happens the other way around. So that's sure. yeah. a yeah. super valuable piece. And are you glad it went that way? Yes, Food definitely. styling first and then food blogging? I feel so for me because it just made me more confident with what I was doing. I mean, obviously, there's a ton of stuff to learn when you start blogging and it's super overwhelming. But one thing I knew that I was really solid on was my recipe development and my food styling, which I think has helped so much because ultimately, you know, I think photography is such a big part of attracting people to your blog. 
Yes. Oh my gosh, that's so true. I've said that for so long. It's an important piece for your blog, but also platforms like Pinterest are really image heavy and that is a great platform for getting traffic. So I totally agree with you. Okay. So you have a really extensive history with food styling. I love that you worked for Good Housekeeping. Oh (laughs) my goodness. How many years were you there? I was there just for my internship, actually. And then I moved on and freelanced for other people. But I mean, I tell you what, I learned an absolute ton when I was there. And the people were just amazing and so generous with their time. And I just feel like it's just such a great brand to have on your resume because, as we know, they do everything by the book. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so good housekeeping. You've got all of the background that you mentioned. So can you define what food styling is? for us that don't have a definition for it? For sure. I mean, it's interesting. Lots of people would just think, you know, food styling, that's taking pictures of food for the camera. But actually, it's a lot more than that. You know, it really is a sort of, it's a problem solving exercise often. You know, a food stylist will really analyze a recipe before they go to shoot it to kind of figure out if there are any pain points there. You know, they'll be thinking about if there's any tricky ingredients, if there's any technical issues that are going to be hard, for example. And they're, they're going to do an analysis, if you like, before they even begin to make sure that they're getting the absolute best out of that dish and they're making it look as delicious as they can. Okay, so you're analyzing the dish even before you start, before you pull out your camera. I think that's absolutely true. And I think a real top tip for better styling is just to slow down. You know, we all have so much to do with blogging, but actually if you slow down and really plan before you jump into cooking, that's going to be so beneficial to you. You know, it helps to just run through and think, you know, are there any tricky ingredients in here? Am I going to have to shop extra? You know, for example, if you need a shot with a, I don't know, like a runny egg yolk, you're going to have to buy a lot of egg. You're going to have to do that shot more than once. So if you just get into that habit of constantly scanning ahead and thinking, you know, that does really, really help you out. And you can also, you know, right from the off, you can just start to think about the type of shot you're going for. You know, is it going to be something that's light, bright and airy with lots of fresh ingredients, you know, on a marble background? Or is it something that's going to be like moody and cozy? Maybe it's a winter stew and you're going to need something that's, you know, a little bit darker. So I think, you know, right from the get go, if you slow down and really consider what you're aiming for, that's very, very helpful. How much time do you spend beforehand? And kind of talk us through an example, if you don't mind, like you're shooting a pasta dish, just some of the things that you would think through. So if I was shooting, as I say, I would always stop before I uh, I start even prepping and think about what I'm trying to get to. You know, I think that a picture should tell a story and you also need to think, you know, what are going to be the process shots to try and show your your reader how you got to your end result. We also know now that Google's looking for process shots, you know, it wants everybody to bring you step by step by step through a recipe. So, you know, rather than diving in, you think about how you're going to tell that story and you think about how you're going to prep for each each part of that, if you like. Something like a pasta dish, my immediate response would be, you know, is it what type of sauce is going on that pasta? You know, if it's something like a creamy sauce, I would probably immediately think, you know, maybe I'm going to cook the elements of that dish separately. If I was just going to eat the pasta sauce, I'd probably follow the recipe to the letter. But if I'm cooking for food styling, that's different. And I might say, for example, double up the sauce so it looks really delicious and really kind of rich and creamy at the end. Wow. I like that you think through this. I'm admittedly (laughs) and kind of embarrassingly one of those people that just go flies by the seat of my pants and like, oh, well, this looks good. Or I have leftover parsley in the fridge. I'll just sprinkle that on top. But I like this idea of actually thinking through to the end because that can save you so much time. And then also energy on the spot because we've all been there when we've been scrambling like, oh my gosh, the sauce is hot. I have to run it, you know, like scrambling all over the kitchen and that's stressful. (laughs) For sure. I think that's a really good point, Megan. I think like we're all in a rush, aren't we? We're all trying to do more in less time. But I think if you save, you know, if you use a few minutes at the start, that can save you time on the way through. We've all been there, you know, you're trying to get, I don't know, get the, the, the food made before the kids come home, whatever it is. Yeah. But 
but actually the worst thing you can do is like have the food ready but not have thought about the other elements because yeah as we know food doesn't look at its best for long you know you really have to work on having figured out everything else before you get the food ready oh, <laughs> the worst thing yeah. in the world is like running around your kitchen looking for like a pair of tweezers or trying to root around yes. in the fridge root around in the fridge for some parsley to sprinkle on something and you know when you haven't thought about it so I think you know sort of stopping and, and figuring it out beforehand is definitely key do you think through to your hero shot before you even start yeah I mean I definitely do although you know the only caveat to that is that you also have to be fairly flexible because as we know like once you've plated something sometimes you'll take that shot and you'll look at it and you'll think oh my gosh it just looks flat it Mm -hmm. just looks I don't know what's wrong with it and then you'll have to really think on your feet and that's when you do have to be fast and you have to kind of you know change things up so I mean it depends but but yes I do try and think through my hero shot I try and think through my my process shots for sure yeah like adjusting, as you said, being flexible. And I think with time, you get more used to being able to do that. But at first it's like, oh no, that didn't work. Now what? Right? Yeah. I think it's, I think it's hard, you know, without the experience, but it's like anything, you know, don't be daunted because I think as you do it more and more, you definitely can, you know, figure out your own sense of style and you can have a look that, you know, that you're trying to achieve that that, that does sort of make you stand out in comparison to other people. It's like anything with blogging, consistency, practice, you know, and also don't panic. If, If you don't like the shot, you don't have to throw it away. You know, you can try to modify it at the end to lift it and to make it look more like what you might have had in mind. What are some elements that you use to help your images stand out? I think layering is really important. I think if you look for images that you really like, say if you're looking for a food magazine and you start to try and analyse those, you can often see that there is a depth there. So for example, if you're plating a soup, you might have a background and then on top of that, you'd have a tablecloth. And then on top of that, you might have a plate and then you'd have your bowl and then you'd pour your soup and then you might garnish your soup and then you might add some cracked black pepper to your soup. And by the time you've done all of that, you know, your image is starting to acquire some interest and it becomes more compelling, I guess, to the person who's looking at it. So I think that's definitely one thing. I think also movement is another one that you need to think about. So, you know, the classic one is pouring syrup onto pancakes. You know, movement draws the reader in. But I think that's another way that you can make your image look compelling. I think another thing that's important is just making sure it doesn't look too perfect. <laughs> it's a real balance yeah. here because you you don't want your image to look super messy and sloppy. You don't want there to be like crumbs all over the place and drips and, you know, mm. spills. But obviously, like a few crumbs here and there can mm. lift your image from being very boring and very sterile to looking super delicious and also a little bit more approachable. So I think once you have got your food picture, you know, you really have to kind of look through a very critical eye at it and just really ask yourself, like, is there something else I can do to just lift this or layer it up and just Mm. take it, take it to the next level? I love all of that. I think the movement is really common in the food niche because like you mentioned, the pours or the drizzles. I love the cheese pulls. Yeah, Just something implying that there's a hand reaching in and pulling it out. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah, I think it just adds a bit of authenticity to it as well, doesn't it? We don't want things that look too too perfect because they're off-putting. But yeah, the cheese pull, everybody always asks about the cheese pull. It's funny. (laughs) (laughs) They're hard. Some cheese pulls are hard, but when you pull it off, oh my, they're amazing. It's so satisfying. It's so satisfying. Definitely anything with cheese is one of those recipes. Like you should automatically have your alarm bell ringing and like, I need to buy extra cheese. And also, you know, you've got got to accept sometimes you can't reheat cheese. Like you get one shot, you know. Yes, it's so true. You should be using the right cheese, you know, mozzarella is always the best for the pull and you need like on something like a grilled cheese, you really need, to, it's the way you cook it as well. You need to cook it kind of low and slow. If you go yes. too far, too fast, it can separate the cheese. You know, you don't get that nice long pull. And if it doesn't work, you have to accept it. Like you can't reheat it. Like you have to start again. <laughs> it's such a bummer. I have photographed a lot of grilled cheese and oh my and eaten a lot because of that because it's like oh this one's done have to start over (laughs) there's got to be some consolations yes exactly (laughs) at least they're delicious right exactly exactly 
Do you think about your styling when you're shopping? I absolutely do. Yeah. And it sounds silly, but I do think good food styling does begin with shopping. And I have to say, like, food stylists are just shopping ninjas. I feel like I I got to know New York City through the grocery shopping. It's such a good way to to get to know it. You know, and it does make such a difference. It's just a good habit to get into. If, for example, you're doing a salad and there's only three ingredients, like, it really does help to get the very best ingredients you can get. You know, if it's a tomato and onion salad, like, you know, it's it's worth going to the farmer's market and trying to get that super, super red tomato mm. as opposed to like the anemic one you might get at the supermarket because that's just going to lift it. It's all about bringing your reader in and making your reader choose your recipe over your competitor's recipe. And, you know, something like a, a great ingredient can help with that. I think as well, you need to kind of start to realize that, again, it's like certain ingredients seem so simple, like a very simple food, like a burger, you know, that seems easy, but something like a burger bun can really hold up your styling. If you if your burger bun smushed, you know, that's going to really be noticeable on the on the picture. So, you know, just take the time when you're shopping as much as you can to just try to ensure that those things, you know, that, that the things you're picking are the best they can be. So not to rely on Instacart, maybe when you have produce or... <laughs> well, we all have to at times, I totally I know. It. But like wherever you can, it's not necessarily about buying the most expensive thing. It's just like thinking about how it needs to look in your picture and then just making sure, you you know, that informs your shopping choices, I guess. Yeah. I don't know about you, but there have been so many times when I use Instacart. By the way, I love Instacart. <laughs> but <laughs> when when you put produce in and then you, like you said, the anemic tomato or something, you're like, oh, this is not what I envisioned at all. So if you're choosy about a specific ingredient to just maybe go do that, scope it out yourself. I think so. And just get to know like the great local, you know, food stores. Like I've got an amazing little Asian grocery store up the road from me, which is brilliant. You know, the, the veggies in there are better than I get in, you know, fancy uh, grocery markets. So just get to know what what's on offer. And, you know, you never know sometimes as being a food stylist, you'll need something crazy. You know, you'll, you'll need a turkey in July. You know, you need to kind of be aware and kind of get to know the people that can help (laughs) when you need slightly unusual or difficult ingredients. Yeah. And that might mean going to a handful of places, but then at least you know you're getting quality ingredients. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Hello, awesome food bloggers. I'm going to hop in really quick here to chat about Rank IQ. You may have heard me talk about this keyword research tool a lot over the past few years, and there is a reason for it. It is such a great tool, and most importantly, it has helped me to grow my blog traffic by leaps and bounds. Before I started using Rank IQ, my traffic had been stagnant for quite a while. I had dabbled in other keyword research tools, but just never got my footing with any sort of productive strategy. Almost immediately, I saw increased blog traffic after starting to use Rank IQ. After years of seeing no growth, in fact, traffic declines much of that time, This was music to my ears, so I approached it with the mindset, do more of what is working. I have been using Rank IQ consistently for two and a half years now, and I have seen significant traffic growth every year since. Looking at my analytics right now, I'm doing a comparison. Traffic this year, January through present, compared to the same period the previous year, my overall traffic is up 85% year over year. Last year, the same comparison was in the ballpark of 50% up year over year, and the previous year, it was something like 65% up. Want to see a traffic explosion on your site too? Go to rankiq.com to get started. Now back to the episode. And then how do you prep for styling? I know there's a lot of prep involved in just, even if styling is not top of mind, we have to do like the ingredient shots a lot of people do and the process shots. So how do you prep? Well, I mean, I like to, I don't know if everyone likes to wear like this, but I like to have a day where I'm cooking. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me to be, you know, writing on my desk and then running over to the kitchen, doing a bit over there, then back to the, you know, I try and batch it up. You know, when I was food styling professionally, you know, on on a sheet, you could be doing, I don't know, eight to 10 recipes a day. I mean, they really, (laughs) you know, get through them. So I think it, for me, it makes sense to prep all together. 
And then you know that you are being efficient with your time. And I, I think that really helps, actually, because we all have to compartmentalize so much with blogging. So if you can get a few recipes together and do them on the same day, I think that really helps. You know, it goes without saying, you know, you've gone to all this trouble with shopping. Just make sure you store all your ingredients properly. You know, things like like mm-hmm. herbs being left like on the wrong, on you know, in the wrong bit of the fridge and sort of going all wilty. Like you can just avoid that. Just you know, wrap them up in some damp paper towel, make sure they're being stored properly, all of that stuff. Again, it just really, really helps, I think. And I think when you're prepping, just remember you are not cooking to eat the food you're cooking to shoot the food and it's kind of two different things you know something like if you're making a pasta dish for dinner you're going to cook that pasta until it's al dente it's perfect but if you're styling with it and you've got a few recipes to get through you might want to take that pasta off you know a couple of minutes before it's cooked store it you know put it in a ziplock with some olive oil it's going to be fine it will hold and it will hold up better actually if it's not fully cooked so again it's just sort of remembering that cooking for the camera is not the same as cooking to eat the food if that makes sense and similarly you know if you're if you're prepping meat you know the camera might not see a sear on say for example if you're cooking something like I don't know, um, pork tenderloin, the camera might not see the sear in the same way as your eye would. So you might need to sear it for a little bit longer Mm. than if you were eating it, you know, to really make sure you get that lovely deep golden brown crust. So again, just think, you know, you might have to go the extra, extra minute or two to make sure the camera picks up on that. Yeah, those are such great tips. And the herb thing, so many times I've been like, well, I have fresh chives and then you go and yeah, you I stored them improperly. So then they're like <laughs> brown or wilted. I know. I mean, I think also any anytime you're using green vegetables as well, you know, you wouldn't do this if you were eating broccoli for dinner, but you might want to blanch it and then shock it in ice water to refresh it because it locks in that green color, you know. So even if your recipe doesn't call for you to blanch the broccoli, You could absolutely do that anyway, because you're going to get a nicer color for your finished result. Yeah. Great tips. Love all of this. The searing is a great tip too, just to accentuate things a little bit more for the camera because you don't, I experience that all the time where I see something with my eyes. And then when I look at the picture, it's not the same. It's just, it shows up differently. It's funny you say that, Megan, because you almost have to develop a sort of double vision, you know, where you're really, really almost obsessively checking the detail at every turn, because as you say, it doesn't look the same. When, When you see it on the screen, it doesn't look the same. So yeah, it's true. Never shows up the same. Okay. So do you have like a little kit or things that you use? You mentioned tweezers earlier, anything else that you use for food styling? I do. I do for sure. And I think it really is a good idea to do this. I think a home styling kit doesn't have to be huge, but a few key items are definitely going to help you lift your final results. What I use is a set tray. You know, it's just a clean half sheet pan, which I put everything on. And then I know I have it when I come to shoot, I have everything that I need. So I think if you can do that in advance, it's just a great habit to get into. Everything on your set tray should really be there to help you sort of tweak that food to make it look better or fresher or the most appealing it can be. Obviously, you need to have sharp knives to hand. I always try and have a chef's knife and a paring knife because you want to have those nice clean cuts on your food. And that really does help to make your your food stand out. Um, tweezers, that's always the classic one with food stylists, but they are really useful. You know, any job that's kind of too fiddly for your fingers you can use tweezers. I like to have like one long pair and one shorter pair, depending on what I'm using them for. Also Q-tips, they're really useful for like any spills or drips. As we said earlier, it's good to make your food look a little bit lived in, but obviously you don't just want like smears all over your plate. (laughs) So having stuff on hand, um, paper towels as well to mop up any spills, you know, and drips that you don't want is super useful. I also get in the habit of I half my paper towels again so they're squares and I just have a stack of of squares piled up so that I'm not using like a ton of of paper towels when I'm when I'm styling if that makes sense. Yeah. Toothpicks they're also really useful like for nudging food around but not sort of making a mark on it and if you have got something quite technical like a burger or a sandwich to style obviously a toothpick can be really helpful for holding different items together. And obviously, you know, 
you can't see them, but they're making sure that all the different layers are standing in the right place. And anything tall, like a stack of pancakes, you can anchor with the toothpicks. That's really useful. Spritz bottles. That's the other one <laughs> that oh, I think yeah. people always want to know about. I definitely think they're super helpful. They help you refresh produce. Also like meat slices, anything that is sitting around for a minute, you know, can, can start to look a little bit dry. So a spritz really helps to refresh and also herbs. It helps to refresh those. You can have one filled with oil and then you can have one filled with just water and then you can have one with a little bit of olive oil in it too or you know vegetable oil and that just helps to give a little sheen it's especially good for things like steak slices you know where you want to make them look really juicy and delicious I also think like squeeze bottles and plastic syringes are good too for adding sauces Ooh. They just give you a little bit more control. You know, if you're trying to style a burger and you want to see like the distinct kind of layer of ketchup and a layer of mayo, whatever it is you've got, then you can just ease that on with a plastic syringe, which is so, so much easier than trying to kind of blob it with a spoon. Spatulas, they're really useful, like offset spatulas, anything that's creamy, like any dairy. You know yourself, like if you just kind of blob it into a bowl it really doesn't look appealing if you use a spatula to kind of spread it around it starts to catch the light when you take that photo and it just looks much more appealing and it you know it just stands out better yeah brushes they help too you know you can use them for all kinds of things different sizes I have you know you could use the brush to brush some oil over something that's looking dry you can use a bigger brush to get crumbs off your set you know or to brush crumbs onto something you know so definitely a selection of brushes is really useful and then you can also keep you know things like cooking spray and kitchen bouquet that's towards the more sort of artificial end of food styling but sometimes kitchen bouquet you know the if you haven't come across it it's it's like the browning seasoning sauce that can really help you know if you're trying to kind of brown up a turkey it's almost like spray tanning it I always think (laughs) you can put a drop of that in a spritz with some water and spray it you know and it really it kind of brings that kind of you can do it before you put the turkey in the oven and it just makes it look a you know a little bit more golden and it gives that kind of luster you know Mm. so that's another another tip but I definitely think it's worth kind of compiling your own set tray that you can just have every time that you're shooting well, your tray sounds impressive, Joe. I've <laughs> never had a tray like this. I must say I've had a few elements here and there, but usually it's like my fingers and whatever's within reach. You'd probably be appalled if you watched me take pictures, actually. I'm sure, I would. <laughs> I'm sure I've done everything and more. <laughs> but it's goals like this. It sounds so like this would make my life so much easier if I just had everything there. Simplify the whole process, I think. I think that's true. Yeah. I love hearing you talk through your your kit. What do you do for backdrops? Okay, so for backdrops, again, as I said, you know, before you start, you just want to think about the mood that you're trying to create. I mean, I tend to shoot, my style tends to be like quite light, bright, airy, lots of fresh produce. So I tend to go with lighter backgrounds. But, you know, there's so many options for this and it doesn't have to be expensive. I feel like I've shot on everything in my house, you know, the floor, the table, a chopping board. You can get linens and lay them down. You can obviously buy, there's so many places now online where you can buy your own food styling backdrops, which is amazing and there's so many to choose from I mean I've also made my own backdrops and it's it's not hard at all you know you can just make a backdrop out of a piece of MDF you know if you get two or three complementing paint colors you can sort of paint over it you can even do it with a sponge and you can sort of sponge those colors on so that they complement each other and then at the end if you sand it down it can start to get that lovely kind of rustic lived in look so that's another option for a backdrop you know it doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be expensive just a little bit of planning and figuring out you know what color you're going for and you know there's lots of options Options. Tiles are great. You know, that's another one that I've used in the past. You can buy them from, a, you know, from a home goods or wherever and just stick those onto a, an MDF board. You know, there's lots of options. Get creative. One that I've used, I've had this board forever, like probably since I moved into our house, which was seven years ago. I still use it all the time. It's just an MDF board with like sticky fake granite. So it was like a roll of basically like a giant sticker that looks like white granite. And it has held up so well and I love it. I love the look. It's 
it's amazing and so cheap. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to keep your ears, your eyes peeled for those because, yeah. well, I mean, I remember literally in the street in Brooklyn, I found this amazing like checkerboard. It's like an old wooden checkerboard. I still use it to this day oh. and it's beautiful. Like you can't really fake that old lived in wood, you know, it's, it's just so nice. So I think, you know, you've got to keep your eyes open because you never know. There's lots of sources for backgrounds, I think. And it's, it's quite good to take your inspiration from, you know, the different textures and the different colors. It's, it kind of, of all it all builds in and adds in yeah yeah it I think it is different for everyone everyone's going to have a different preference and mm-hmm. like you mentioned mood and something that complements your style so yeah exactly. checkerboard what a great yeah. find that's such a that's so cool okay let's see what are we missing is there anything else as far as details maybe garnishes do you want to talk about garnishes a little bit yeah, for sure. I mean, as I said earlier, I think with garnishing, it's all about layering up the dish. You kind of build it up and build it up, you know, especially if it's a food that's tricky to style. So some foods are just tricky to style. And again, it's good to kind of start to realize in advance what they are. So anything that's brown, you know, brown soups, brown stews, it's great to consider in advance how you're going to bring those to life, right? I think so. Garnish is a major way of doing that. I think the garnish should always complement the dish. It shouldn't be so random that you're thinking, what on earth is that doing on that dish? <laughs> you know, it should it should be something that, you know, complements the recipe, but does add genuinely add something. I think, you know, with brown foods, it's good to have something contrasting if you can. So often that's why we'll have, you know, sour cream with a chili or we'll have, you know, coconut cream with a curry. Once you've got that sort of lighter element, you that you then might want to add in some fresh herbs. You know, once the fresh herbs are in, maybe you're thinking, oh, I like that. It's, it's improved, but actually maybe I also need some pepper flakes or a grinding of black pepper. And you can sort of build it up from there. And I think that actually that's one of the easiest kind of ways to really make your, your food stand out and look different it's just kind of building up layer on layer and kind of maybe assessing once you've you've added one thing and thinking do I need to add something else if so what is that yeah the trick that I used the most simple trick ever when I first started taking photos of food was pepper I remember thinking oh my gosh it was so easy to transform this ugly brown casserole or whatever it was just with a sprinkle of pepper I mean it can be as simple as that it's so true I think that's that's exactly right it doesn't have to be difficult but it's just about taking the time to think about it yeah I think that's completely true and then what do you do for like props and plating this is where I get hung up because I am super lazy I like to go fast and be as efficient as possible and so I, I often don't think to this realm but yeah enlighten us <laughs> I think though in a way your instinct is it's not wrong because as bloggers we we can't spend too long futzing over props you know we have to remember that the food our food is the star of the show and it should really be the central image I mean you don't have the luxury of a lot of space nowadays you know you're thinking about a thumbnail on Google Uh, so often it is good to have you know to have your plate take center stage I mean I think you know it's great to think about propping but I do think some people become you know too hung up on that because you know that is there to support the main image remember so yes it's nice to include some other things for interest and for detail and just to make your image you know stand out or different but you know at the same time I think you're right in a way not to kind of get too hung up on that stuff oh good (laughs) yeah I mean I I try and think about how to tell the story you know make sure that you've got all your ingredients in your process shots and make sure that you're including you know if if a soup has multiple ingredients you know make sure that the that the person who's looking at it can see what's in the soup from the picture it's amazing how many times you know you'll go, you'll click on, I don't know, like a mushroom and chicken and rice soup and you can't really tell what you're looking at. It sounds, it sounds basic, but you know, really ask yourself, can I see every element of the dish in my finished, in my finished product, you know? And I think that that's, that's really helpful for your hero shot and let your propping kind of fall in with that. Don't be too hung up on that because I agree it can take so much time and that's not necessary. Right. Yeah, that was a good point too about making sure you can see all of the ingredients. I don't know how many times I've gotten done and I'm like, oh no, there was corn there and I couldn't see the corn yeah, or yeah. whatever. So I had to go back and I mean make sure another can... another tip, Megan. I you know, yeah. when I'm cooking, if it's something that's, you know, got multi ingredients like a soup, you know, as we just talked about, like a chicken, rice and mushroom soup, for example, often I will even pull out those ingredients when I've cooked them. So I might sear off my mushrooms oh, and I would yeah. I would literally look for like 
the five or six pretty mushrooms that I can really tell have a nice stalk and a nice shape. And I'll literally set those aside on a plate whilst I cook the rest of the soup. Similarly, if I'm shredding the chicken, I'll save and reserve, you know, some nicely shredded chicken to the end when I'm actually shooting. And if I can't see the chicken clearly and I can't see the mushrooms in my end shot, you know, I'll add those pieces in at the end. I'll integrate them, you know, I'll make them look like they are in in the bowl. I won't just stick them on the top right. but like I can make sure by doing that that I I know that every element of the dish can be seen and I think that's a, you know it's quite a handy way of of making sure great tip I think I used to do that that was long ago <laughs> now I'm like oh whatever <laughs> whatever flies yeah and it's a balance because you don't want to make it look artificial you know yeah. you want to make it look like a real dish but I do think it helps totally agree okay any other tips for food styling I mean, I just think, as I said earlier, you know, just don't be daunted and just keep keep practicing and you really will develop your own style. It's easy to be to be put off when you see a perfect image in a magazine, but you've got to remember, you know, there's probably 10 people that have been involved on that right. shoot. <laughs> you know, you are one person at home. So don't be daunted and don't be put off and just experiment, experiment, experiment and really look at your photos. And I mean, I, I don't know about your blog, but on my blog, I think my top Probably my top ten traffic posts are also my top ten best photos. Honestly, I think ah. it's I think it's really, really that simple. You know, if you look at the look at the posts that are doing well and look at the images and see if they have anything in common and see if they, you know, if they are your stronger images, try to kind of reproduce more of what you were doing in those photos. So I'm looking at your blog and I love that your a lot of your images are really close up focusing in on you know, what the food is. And I yeah. feel like a lot of food stylists do more of a way back, like scene, you know, yeah. with extensive props and colors and mood. I really appreciate that you do this. This is totally my style as well. Like, let's get to it. Let's show the color. Let's show the details of the ingredients, that sort of thing. I think so, because I just think as bloggers, we don't have the luxury of having all of that space and being able to mm -hmm. pick out beautiful props and a lovely tablescape. I mean, that looks great in a magazine, but as a blogger, you just, you want to show the food off. You want to make it look super enticing. You want to get somebody to click on that and to want to make it. And I think in order to do that, the close up is like super compelling because you can see all those delicious ingredients. Right. Yeah. Like focusing in, I'm looking at one that has Parmesan cheese and you can see just the detail of the cheese and you can't do that if you don't get close in on the dish right I think that's absolutely true for yeah. sure I love your style it's beautiful thank you thank you so much well thank you so much for joining us Joe. this was enlightening and inspiring too as someone who definitely does not take <laughs> much time to take photos these days thank you for inspiring us oh of course thank you for having me do you have either a favorite quote or words of inspiration to leave us with? I think I have two for blogging. My first one is you can have your success or you can have your excuses. You can't have both. And that's me sometimes, you know, when you're feeling like it's a lot to do and it's overwhelming, like you just have to keep going. You just have to keep being consistent. So I try and remember that one. And my other one would be how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Because I think that's, you know, another one. It's a nice foodie reference, but like... It really is a lot to blog and you've, you're wearing so many hats, food stylist being one of them, just one of them. So, you know, you just have to sort of take it slow and keep, keep going one piece at a time and you will definitely get there. Love both of those. Thanks for sharing those. Uh, we'll put together a show notes page for you. If you want to go look at those, you can head to eatblogtalk.com forward slash the family food kitchen. Tell everyone where they can find you, Joe. Yeah, so my blog is The Family Food Kitchen. I'm on Instagram at Joanna Kiahan. My Pinterest is The Family Food Kitchen too and Facebook Family Food Kitchen. Everyone go check out Joe's amazing photos and content. And thank you again for being here, Joe. And thank you for listening, food bloggers. I will see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Eat Blog Talk. If you are craving accountability, focus, and connection at a low monthly cost, join the Eat Blog Talk accountability group at eatblogtalk.com forward slash focus. I will see you next time.